there's just some clarification I'd like to emphasize on the question for you here, uh, where you're looking at, at uh, using an existing thickener and increasing the flow rates from 180 to 225 meters per hour. The question just to clarify is, is give the options that you can use to investigate having an increasing uh, flow rate. And the final one to clarify is be clear on the expected magnitude of your effect. So for a given change that you plan to investigate, what is going to be the magnitude of the effect on the increased flow? Will you be, is it a linear relationship to flow, quadratic? How is your change going to affect flow? Uh, the flow rate increase through that. Then in question four, the other clarification that you need is um, there is no throughput given there yet. Um, so I've got no specification of the volumetric flow rates coming into that unit. I forgot to put that into the question. I will uh, give that piece of information to you tomorrow. Um, and, uh, I forgot what the number is, so off the top of my head I don't know it, but I will, I will, I will let you know what it is tomorrow. Or post on the website. So that's assignment two is relatively straightforward for uh, GMT. Okay, so today's class is on centrifuges. Um, so the main principle here behind centrifugal separations are to handle the case where gravity is not good enough. So the, rep, the natural separate that we get from the sedimentation vessel, the thickener or a clarifier, is not good enough for us. It's going to take too long. Or uh, well, the separation factor that we're getting from that uh, unit is not high enough. So we require even greater clarification of the liquid stream in the overflow. The other main advantage, of course, of the centrifuge that you see today is that you get a much, much smaller unit. So the thickener or clarifier is going to take up a big piece of real estate in your company. Uh, we're going to show the equations here and calculate the equivalent surface area you would require for a thickener, but now we're going to show a much, much smaller centrifuge. Uh, so so it, it's a phenomenal reduction in surface area required, just by increasing the, the, by the centrifugal force. And then there's many separations that we just cannot possibly achieve by gravity. No matter how long we leave the material there, we will never get separation. So a uh, classic example of that is very fine material dispersed in liquid. A variety of motion is going to keep those solids suspended. Emulsions with a stabilizing effect of the emulsion. Um, for example, milk is a good example of emulsion where those fat, fat uh, particles in milk will never separate out from the milk if you just leave it there naturally by gravity. Uh, there's often convection currents in some of the larger units that uh, will, will upset any State, uh, setting that is occurring. So we really have to look at something that is more powerful than gravity sedimentation. And last time when we looked at, at sedimentation, we said, well, we've got this a constant flocculation. Why don't we just use that? Why don't we just always flocculate and then uh, get a small sedimentation vessel, a cheap piece of plastic uh, ground container that we can use to settle our material? And let gravity do it us for free, right? So we don't have any energy costs due to centrifugal. There's a whole lot of safety issues that we'll see in refining centrifuges. Why don't we just populate and, and call it a day? That's the yeah, that's the main reason. Flocculant, firstly, there's a cost, it's a mass separating agent. Um, and then secondly, if we were say separating the, the cream from milk, you wouldn't want to add a flocula to that. You want both the cream and the milk afterwards from the separating vessel in as pure a state as possible. So the flocula is introducing a third contaminant potentially that you now have to take care of. Um, that would be true also in many bio separations. So if you're just trying to separate a, a useful bacteria that's going to be an end product from the, from the rest of the liquid, you don't want to introduce an extra mass separating agent that you now have to take care of. So it's sometimes easier and cheaper to introduce an energy separating agent, which we'll do through the use of, of centrifugal force. Uh, so let's just get some terminology consistent here. We have here on the, on the left hand side a, a picture of a laboratory type centrifuge. Most of you, I'm sure, have seen 
or even use such a unit. The principle is obviously an even number of, of containers on the side uh, around the circumference there. And we'll put, call, put that centrifuge tube in, we load it with the suspended material, so that's the mixture of, of the material we're trying to separate. And after spinning it for a, a certain duration and at a certain uh, speed, we will then have a precipitate forming at the bottom, which is sometimes called a pellet, especially for laboratory terminology, but for industrial terminology, we'll call that a precipitate or even just a sediment itself forming at the bottom. And then the clear is supernatant out to the top of the clarified liquid. So those are, those are the terminology that we should be comfortable with. It's, it's very similar to sed uh, the sedimentation. So this principle of using centrifugal force to separate has uh, we've been using it for years and years to separate cream from milk, for example. Um, but the main, the main use is anywhere we've got a density difference between the fluids we're trying to separate, we could, we could consider centrifugal uh, operation. Um, also, not just between solids and fluids, but we could also even separate liquids from liquids and also we can also separate gases from gases. Um, and then the other case is where it's sometimes used is for draining fluid from particles, so it's a centrifugal filtering step. Um, we'll cover filtration in the next week, um, and then you can, you can enhance filtration by applying centrifugal force rather than just pressure. Then I'll leave this for you in your own time and you can look at centrifugal pack bed contactors. These are the units that are uh, useful to enhance mass transfer. Um, a lot of separation there, though, but it's the same principle being applied. So I've mentioned this example of separating cream from milk. That's, a, that's a one, one way of doing it. Uh, where centrifusion is used a lot is for clarification of, of beverages. So beer, where uh, you remove yeast from the beer, is, is, is that's a very common application. We'll be doing units tomorrow to separate yeast from beer. Uh, juice, essential oils, uh, to clarify those essential oils that are then sold and for use in food preparation purposes. Uh, we want to clarify and remove any uh, solid particles or contaminants from it. Bioseparation is obviously very, very uh, common. And then, um, in the oil sense, centrifuge is used to separate sand and water from heavy oils that come out of the ground. So, a number of uses. Here's the gas gas separation example. Uh, this is a photo from the 1980s from a US laboratory. Uh, each one of these circular units is a centrifuge, it's a zippy type centrifuge, and it's separating out um, very, very uh, minor differences between uranium 235 and its hexafluoride space versus from U238. Um, and each one of these units does such a minor, minor separation that we have to put them into a counter current uh, series over here that's showing many, many such units. Um, and to, to get any appreciable degree of uh, separation. So I'll talk about this a little bit more um, coming up towards the end of the class. So here we separate two gases that have very minor density, density differences. It's not just to do the solids. If I see this image here, we can just take a look at each one of these units. Uh, we see the inlet pipe, and we see the two outlets leading over there. And then, there's some uh, wiring and instrumentation and control. And that, that control is the critical part of this unit that make, uh, allows it to succeed, is how well we can control the speeds and the stability of the unit. Okay, so let's, let's uh, delve into some mathematics and modeling for, uh, for centrifuges. The, the main principle, as I said, is of course we require a density difference between the two materials we're wanting to separate. Notice here, it's not a difference in mass. We require only a density difference between the two materials we're trying to separate. So uh, here, for example, um, is a, I was wondering this yesterday, and I thought this would be interesting to show. What happens if you centrifuge mayonnaise? <coughs> so one hour at 2,600 G to get that water uh, or the liquid separated from the uh, rest of the egg milk uh, suspension. So that, that's an incredibly long separation. It's like one example of something that wouldn't separate naturally. 
So there's a density difference there between that liquid phase and that egg phase that causes the separation to occur after a long period of time. What are the forces acting on those two uh, components in, in the separation? Well, the centrifugal force is the force that always acts in the outward direction. And we've all done this experiment. We've attached a weight to a piece of string and we're swinging it around. You can feel that string pulling on your hand. Uh, that force of the, of the material trying to act in the outward direction. And then there's a corresponding balancing force, the centripetal force, pulling, pulling it back. Those two are in balance. The centrifugal force, fugal meaning Latin flying away, flying out, and centripetal force pulling it in are counteracting each other. So the centrifugal force acting in the outward direction proportional to the acceleration and the constant of proportionality there being the mass of the object. So we've got the particle's mass m, the radial distance from the center point r, and then the angular velocity, which is simply saying the number of radians you're changing over time. So omega is d d theta, the angle, d theta by d t. So it's just a rate of change of the angle per unit of time. So those are the three key variables we need to calculate that force in our force balance. So the mass of the particle, the radial distance from the center point, and then the angular velocity, which is the change in radians per, per unit time. So just, uh, just as a refresher, we uh, recall, of course, that the, a, a full circle has two pi radians. So the, a full circle per unit time, the, the SI unit for that is per hertz. Um, unfortunately, this whole area of centrifusion is dominated by non-SI units. So we will, unfortunately, revert to units such as revolution per minute. Um, that's the common way of understanding and interpreting this. Um, my preference is as far as possible to always work in SI units, but here the whole literature is just filled with RPM, so we'll, we'll use that terminology as well. But that's how you can convert revolutions per minute back to the SI units. Um, so the full circle, which has got roughly uh, two pi radians, or about six radians, if you do one of those per second, you're doing roughly 10 revolutions per minute. Okay, so that's the relationship between uh, revolutions per minute and the SI units. The other thing that we often uh, quantify our centrifugal by is the number of Gs. So how many times are we exceeding the natural gravitational force so if we got our force over here due to centrifusion in the numerator, that's mr omega squared, and we've got the force due to gravity pulling down mg, the ratio of that is just the number of g's we're applying to the particle. So here I've got a few examples to give you an idea of, of the number of g's and RPMs. If you drive your car in a very tight radius of about six meters, round and round, you could probably get away with doing about 10 of those per minute ever try doing something like that. Um, it's, it's a nice little thrill that you can have. That G that you're creating for yourself is about one to two Gs. So if you're taking a corner 90 degrees turning left at the traffic light, which person in the back seat is experiencing the highest number of Gs? The person sitting in the back left or the back right? If I'm turning at the traffic light and turning left, Two passengers at the back, who's experiencing the greater number of Gs? Back right, they've got a further radius away uh, from that center point. So if you're looking at your washing machine at home during the spin cycle when it's removing the water, uh, there it is about 1,500 revolutions per minute of the drum. And assuming that drum to have a radius of half, a, a, a diameter of half a meter or a radius of a quarter meter, that's about 625 Gs that you're clothes are experiencing in the washing machine. Okay. Um, an industrial type centrifuge that we'll look at here in this class, they, they operate in the order of 15,000 RPMs, or uh, if we're taking the radius of that unit to be about 10 centimeters, then that would be 25,000 Gs <laughs> for smaller size industrial unit. Uh, the laboratory centrifuges, they tend to go much, much higher uh, there are smaller units, we can engineer them to go faster speeds. At that high speed of 100,000 revolutions per minute, that's called ultra centrifugation. Uh, that's to remove really, really tiny particles from fluid. There you're, you're 
you're subjecting that material up to that number of keys, it's very high number. And then those zip type centrifuges that I showed you earlier, those are rotating at 90,000 revolutions per minute. The only way you can possibly achieve that is through this incredibly good uh, process control. And secondly, they draw a vacuum out of that unit, so it is, it's, it's essentially operating under vacuum, there's no resistance from air. Um, and there you're getting about a million genes to, to, uh, to, to get that. The tangential velocity, just to put it in perspective, is over Mach, Mach 2, so it's 750 meters per second on the tangential speed of that. Uh, so those centrifuges, those vertical centrifuges that I had up there in the picture, those require really good process control, very, very careful balance. Even fingerprints and contamination on the size of the container will upset the balance of those units. Um, that's how, how carefully balanced they are at those speeds. Okay, so let's just talk the laboratory centrifuges first. Um, if I've got my lab centrifuges, two types in general, there's those where the rotor is uh, fixed at an angle. So my, my containers that I add into it, they stay at and remain at that angle. And there's a difference in radius between the inner uh, inner particles will experience a, a smaller force versus those particles on the outer radius, our max will, will experience a higher force. Then there's other devices where there's a swing out motor. Um, so these would be used, especially they're used in, in tests for blood, for blood work where afterwards the person examining the vial is going to measure the height of the sediment deposited. That's going to be an easy height to measure because it's now going to be perpendicular. Whereas something like this, there's going to be a greater surface area against which the solids deposit is going to be harder to measure. So they have, they have different uses. Um, the key selection criteria for laboratory type centrifuges are, firstly, the manufacturer will have better data than, than what's up here. So you will almost always use the, the manufacturer's manual to determine the time to centrifuge and the, and the speed. Uh, so there's a very, very good and comprehensive graphs and literature that the manufacturer will provide. But this is a, a rough rule of thumb that you can use to estimate uh, the duration for a given speed. So you can pick your speed, RP and max. So this is that RP, the max centrifuges recognize that there's a warm up period through, until you reach your maximum speed. But once you've reached that speed, assume that it remains at that for most of the centrifuge time. So select RP and max. Then you're interested in oh, how long do I need to centrifuge? Uh, to get a separation here, um, you use this equation over here. So we need a K and we need an S to calculate T. So K is a, is a constant given by this equation down here, which is then a function of the geometry of your device, R max and R min, as well as that selected R P M that you chose. And those radiuses are, are used in centimeters. So this is a purely empirical formula, so don't worry about units. Um, they, they're not going to cancel out on that shift. So K is simply uh, a calculated value with R in centimeters, RPMs in revolutions per minute, not in radians per second or purpose. So use RPMs in this equation, calculate K. The S is called the Spedberg constant, the coefficient, and that's dependent on the material itself and is being found from experiments. Uh, and it's also obviously a function of temperature. So centrifuging at higher temperatures uh, lowers the viscosity, which you'll see the theoretical derivation coming up next is going to change the speed of your centrifuge, uh, the centrifuge. So S, an empirically derived coefficient, K, a constant calculated from the geometry and the speed that you've selected, and the ratio of K and S here will give you an estimate of the number of time in minutes that you need. So here's a value of S, for example, at 20 degrees for collagen is 6.43. Okay, so but those are lab, lab centrifuges, so it's just a bit for background, but we're going to be more interested in uh, industrial type centrifuges on a larger scale. So the first major type we will investigate and, and spend most of the time in the class today is on the tubular bowl centrifuge. Now, we're going to derive in a minute the trajectory that a particle would take in the tubular bowl centrifuge, but let's just uh, look at the geometry first of, of such a centrifuge. It's a simple, simple principle. It's a bowl that's uh, sitting down, and we're going to rotate it along the vertical axis. So we're 
spinning a ball horizontally along this vertical axis. Now these units can easily be mounted on a horizontal axis, you can just rotate it this way. <coughs> no difference, right? Because the force of gravity here is so, so minor compared to the centrifugal force that we can read no gravity for all, for all major intensive purposes. But these units are usually, for stability purposes and ease of engineering, they're mounted on a vertical axis and rotated around in that direction. So here's the outer ball walls over here. Our feed is fed up at the center point in the bottom, comes in at the, at the bottom and is split out immediately to the, to the sides. Okay. Where we form essentially a vertical wall of liquid over here. And that the, uh, the wall of the bowl prevents the liquid or forces the liquid to only leave at that particular radial distance from the center. So this radius R1 is the distance from the center point of rotation to the, the edge of that weir. R2 is the full radius of the bowl from the center point to the edge of the bowl. And we form a vertical wall of liquid due to the centrifugal force. That wall of liquid is a height lowercase h. So that's the, the notation we're going to use. Now, a solid particle entering here in the, in the feed, we're going to plot its trajectory over time as it moves through the centrifuge. So remember, these particles are incredibly small. They do not move rapidly through fluid. Otherwise, if they did, we wouldn't be using a centrifuge. We'd be using sedimentation. So these particles are moving incredibly slowly through the fluid at low Reynolds numbers. So it's quite OK to assume that Stokes law is applying. So low velocity of the, of the particle through the fluid. So if we're using Stokes law, Stokes law is a, is, a, is a measure of the force balance on a particle. And here, the only force we really have acting on the particle is the, is the centrifugal force. So it's a simple matter of replacing the uh, G term that we normally see in sedimentation with our own the squared. That's all that's done. And recognizing then that the velocity of the particle is now not in the downward direction, it's in the direction of the centrifugal force, which is out, which is that velocity V is simply the rate of change of the radial position of the particle over time. So dr by dt refers to where this particle is in terms of radius from the center point over time. So this particle, if there uh, would, if we would just had centrifugal force, if we just filled this material uh, into, the, into the centrifuge, we had no new feed coming in, this particle would simply move over time and land against the wall. Through our operating in batch mode. If we just fill the material, turn the centrifuge on, and let it run, that particle would slowly move towards the, to the wall. The reason why we have this parabolic type profile for the type below is, of course, because we're putting new feed into the centrifuge all the time. So we've got the particle is being pushed upwards in the direction of the feed over time, as well as being pulled or being forced upwards due to centrifugal force. So we've got both of those vectors occurring at particles <coughs> going to take parabolic trajectory, much like we saw with sedimentation. Come, the particles are entered. How do you get them out? Yeah. yeah uh, so once the once the material is sedimented, you turn the centrifuge off and you clean it out. It's a it's still a batch process. Yeah. We'll we'll talk about how it's operated, and in in the next few slides. Yeah. Is there a cycle? Are you looking for cycles? Yeah. You're all thinking continuous mode of operation, which is good. We're going to see that in the next unit. So here, very much you you still feed your liquid with particles all the time. The, the sediment layer is going to build up on the walls, and then you're going to stop, clean it up, and, and restart again. Okay. But the, the free material coming in always has liquid and solids constantly being fed. So if we look at that equation up there, dr by dt, it makes perfect sense. If we wanted those particles to reach the wall at a faster time, the rate of change of that particle, we want that particle to reach the wall much quicker what are some of the things you can do? Use a lower viscosity fluid. Anything else? <coughs> right, use a, lot, a, a greater density difference. 
ramp up omega, so, so rotate in a fast way, or use bigger particles. So larger particles will gravitate to the wall, or not gravitate, that's a bad word, would, would be forced to the wall much, much faster. Okay, so larger particles entering here, they would get to that wall in a profile that looks something like this. It'd start over here, larger particles would reach that wall much quicker than smaller particles. That's why we looked at particle size distribution yet on Tuesday's class. We have to recognize that a feed coming in is not a single particle DP, it's now a range of particles DP. So the biggest particles, they'll reach the walls much, much quicker. The smaller particles, they'll take a longer time. And in fact, you could even envision particles whose diameters are so small that their rate of change of radius over time is, is almost negligible, that they kind of get trapped up over here and then leave out in the liquid. So that's, that's what we're going to look at next, is what are the critical parameters in order to meet a certain particle size coming out in our liquid discharge, in our overflow. So, so this is the equation of the particle's trajectory in terms of radius of time. What we can simply do is integrate that. We start at time zero, assuming our particle to enter right at the worst case position, which is at radius r1. So assume a solid particle at time zero entering right at that point there where the, where the laser is. What we would like is that particle to be exactly at radius R2 within a certain time period. Okay. So what we're asking is, what is the time it's going to take here, T subscript T, for a particle to be at the wall of the bowl and, and now caught up and trapped not able to leave. So a simple integration of that previous equation between treating the limits of time from time 0 to time tt from radius r1 to r2 will, will get you that equation as well. Okay, so, so that's that time. Now, one way we can interpret tt is the minimum time a particle should spend in the center. What do I mean by that? Well, if, if that particle spent longer in the centrifuge, oh, sorry, if it spent TT with it. So we want to integrate here, TT is the minimum time in the centrifuge. If I fed my material at a faster feed rate, so my liquid feed rate to that centrifuge was at a faster rate, the vector up is, is now longer, I have the risk that that particle may never reach R2. It may never reach the wall with, by the time it's being forced out of the, out of the centrifuge. Being, given the fact that I've got new feed coming in, replacing it, and pushing everything up. So what we really want is a balance there. We want to feed, feed new material here at a slow enough rate so that we don't wash out the particles before they get the chance to reach the radius R2. So in, from that point of view, we can interpret TT as the minimum time a particle should spend in the centrifuge, or the minimum residence time. Now, the other way you can see it is, if that's the minimum residence time, well, what is the maximum flow rate that you can have coming through the centrifuge? So the maximum flow rate is, uh, is Q, let's call that Q, and flow rate then is simply the volume held up in the centrifuge divided by that time. So Q is equal to the volume held up in the centrifuge divided by the time that the particle spends in the centrifuge. And if the volume, uh, you can just, it's quite easy to show, is, is simply the surface area uh, filled up by the fluid multiplied by the height. So that relationship there defines the volume held up in the centrifuge divided through by that equation that you've just derived from TT. That will give me my maximum volumetric flow rate that I can handle. And that's a great equation to have in mind because it's showing us what we can change in the centrifuge if we needed to increase the volumetric flow rate. If we wanted to handle a greater throughput through the centrifuge, we can use this equation to design either a new centrifuge where we're selecting a new radius for the centrifuge, so a bigger capacity. If I increase R2, I will be able to get a higher throughput. If I increase the height of the centrifuge, I'll get a greater throughput. Um, if I have a larger density difference, or if 
I operate even at higher uh, omegas, at higher angular velocities, I can get greater throughput. So that's, that's one way to use that equation. But the other way to use that equation is in reverse, is to say, I know I have to treat a given flow rate. And this is usually how we, we design uh, the system, is we know we've, we've given a certain target flow rate that we've designed for, Q max, or we'll just call it Q. Find the particle size dp that will arrive at position r2 at the ball's edge, that edge radius r2, at height h. Okay, so given that this flow is fixed, this volumetric flow is fixed, I want my particle to have a trajectory as shown starting at that point. And the worst case is that that particle lands up right at that, at that position at the top. So it needs to reach radius R2 within a time, um, or by, the, by the time it reaches H. So, so that's, a, that's, a, that's one way to see it. And then you can back calculate what that diameter needs to be. That's the largest diameter that will reach that point. Any particle with a smaller diameter will not reach R2 by the time it reaches H. A particle with a smaller diameter we have a trajectory along the lines of starting here, and because it's a smaller diameter, it experiences less of centrifugal force, so they land up over there by the time it reaches high pressure. Then the risk is that it's going to be pulled out with this fluid discharge and leave. So a particle with a smaller diameter than that DP would leave. Particles with a larger diameter, we don't really concern ourselves with because we know they're going to experience a larger centrifugal force. They're going to have a trajectory that brings them and places them against the wall at a much, uh, at, a, at a lower height. Yes, Can you just explain this diagram of the fire? That's the liquid. Okay, yes. and then you have something in the middle spinning. What's the, what is it separated by? <coughs> it's this, this air in the middle. Yeah, so this, the, it's, it's totally open. There's a vertical wall of water due to the centrifugal force. You're splitting things. Centrifugal force. Yeah. So the wall's force is the wall is hold, there's a force vector from the wall in, and then the, there's a, a centrifugal force from the material out. No balancing. Yes. Is there um is there a science determining the rearrangement the difference between R1 and R2? R1 and R2? Yes, uh, so you can we're going to talk about that now. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, R1 and R2 come into this equation, so you can say for a given Q and for a given particle size, what should R1 and R2 be? So this, this is a great equation to, to have, um, to work with, is, is this one over here. For a given flow rate and for given physical properties of the liquid, rho f, u f, and the, and the density of the particle, rho p, we, we, our three parameters are r1, r2, and h. And we're going to look at next how to design these units. Okay. But this is the key equation to have, and, and not just to see, OK, yes, I can plug in numbers and get q max, or I can get q max and that calculate some of the other. Really understand what the implications of that equation are. Uh, and for what is here is, for a fixed q max, I can back calculate the largest particle, the DP's diameter, that will arrive at R2 at height h. So particles with a smaller DP we, we can assume to be supernatant. Those particles would have a tra trajectory that would land, land up here at time edge and then be pulled out of the supernatant. Now that's obviously excessive, right? Because we've got that, that horizontal, that vertical wall over here. So the particle, you could imagine that lands up over there at time edge, is still going to get forced up into the corner. So it's, it's, it's really pointless to say, we're, it's, it's really too stringent, I should say, to uh, expect a particle that lands up at that radius R2 within high H, and then say all other smaller particles will be discharged with the supernatant. That's clearly an over, you're going to over design your uh, unit if you, if you use that. Uh, so, what we say then is uh, those particles, they're going to reach the rear, but they're still going to be retained. So, one thing that we do is rather than find R2, we say, well, what is going to be the diameter of the particle so that it reaches halfway between R1 and R2, so the midpoint. So now we're designing for a trajectory and a DP that would start at R1 and land at the midpoint. 
The diameter of a particle that lands up at that midpoint or to the left of it is going to be retained by the centrifuge. A particle with a smaller diameter that lands up, say, at three quarters, that's going to be pulled out and taken out and supernated discharge. So we, we, we use a, a, a less aggressive criteria now to design our centrifuge. That corresponds a bit closer to reality. So that equation then gets modified. So notice the logarithm here now is a little bit more complicated because our, our bounds when we do that integral are, are now, instead of r2, it's halfway between r1 and r2. So a slightly different integral bounds that leads to a different equation. A similar structure but slightly different. And I'll, call, I'll rename that velocity now, not q max, but I'll call it my cut point velocity. This is the point at which I'm going to cut my particle size distribution. Any particles with a diameter greater than that critical cut diameter, they will be retained by the centrifuge. Particles with smaller diameter, they will be. So we know everything in this equation. We know our design volumetric flow rate. We know our physical properties mu f. We know r1 and r2 and h from the geometry of the centrifuge. We know the angular velocity at which we can operate that, um, that unit. And so it's straightforward to back calculate what that cut diameter is. But now let's take a look at how these units are, are designed in principle. Um, if we take that previous equation and just do an algebraic uh, trick almost, you multiply the numerator and the denominator by 2g, what you'll find is that you, you see the Stokes will appear on, in, in the equation. So that term, the standard terminal settling velocity that we saw in the previous section of sedimentation will appear in the equation. Okay, so this is, this is the velocity that a particle will experience when settling under gravity. And you'll find then there's so here, as I said, it is the previous equation. We've now created this term over here, which is exactly the Stokes law for particle settling under gravity, and then multiplied by a really messy term, sigma, which looks like that over there. Okay. So there's sigma, that's, that fits in over here. So we're now saying Q cut, that the volumetric flow rate that I can handle, is equal to two times the total setting velocity under gravity multiplied by sigma. So I've simply taken this previous equation that I had, multiply numerator and denominator by 2g, I'm not changing it much, but what that does is it creates the Stokes terminal settling velocity under gravity for that same particle diameter, creates that term over here in brackets multiplied by a messy term sigma down below here. So this is saying, if I know my volumetric flow rate, and I know my Stokes terminal settling velocity for the particle under gravity, with no artificial gravitational force, I can calculate sigma. And sigma have, has units of meter squared. Sigma also is only a function of the physical geometry and the speed at which you operate that centrifuge. So sigma is a pure property of the centrifuge itself. It's not a property of the particles or of the fluid. Sigma is only a property of the physical device that you're using. That's the critical idea here. Okay. And sigma, having units of meter squared, corresponds to the cross-sectional area you would have required for regular gravity sedimentation. Okay, so if you calculate a sigma of a thousand meters squared for your given centrifuge, so I can easily calculate sigma if I know R1 and R2, I know omega, and I know the height of my centrifuge. It's straightforward to calculate it. I can say, well, that unit centrifuge has the equivalent surface area of a sedimentation vessel of a given diameter. Surface area. So this is a great way to quantify the separability of sediment centrifuge. Larger sigmas are obviously more desirable because they correspond to having a larger sedimentation vessel. It also gives you an idea of the tremendous reduction in real estate that you've been able to 
achieve. So rather than building a monster sized sedimentation vessel of a thousand meters squared, you can now get away with a much more smaller unit that you can have in a laboratory or an industrial plant with much smaller, much less surface area. So we use Sigma in, a, in a, uh, actually quite substantially, is used uh, substantially for designing these units. And it's quite simple. If I take centrifuge A and centrifuge B, um, I simply use that equation there. So my cut flow rate in a given centrifuge A, let's take, let's take centrifuge A as being the smaller centrifuge. This is my laboratory style centrifuge, or maybe it's a small bench uh, lab scale or a uh, pilot plant scale type centrifuge. I can calculate its volumetric flow rate and, it, and I can calculate its sigma grams. For the larger centrifuge that I plan to design, I know what the design flow rate needs to be. I can back calculate what sigma needs to be. So simply take the ratio of those two equations. The terminal setting velocity is the same in both situations. I'm, I'm processing the same fluid in both units. So the ratio of those, once I know the flow rate of my lab scale unit and the sigma value of my lab scale unit, I say, well, for a given industrial size unit, uh, which I need to design a certain volumetric flow rate for, what needs to be its sigma? And once I have sigma, I can then go find settings of R1, R2, omega, and H that meet that sigma requirements. Okay. Now, the key point here is that sigma is only scalable within the same type of equipment. I can't put take sigma from a tubular bowl centrifuge and apply it to a disc bowl centrifuge. Okay. What do I, I mean by that? Well, we've so far looked only at the tubular bowl centrifuge. Um, there are other types. So, here, let's just, uh, let's just finish up on tubular bowl centrifuges. The, as, as was asked earlier, well, what happens to the solids? Well, we have to stop and clean them out and restart. And so what we will often do in companies is put a, a paper around the wall to assist in the solids removal. Um, it is about a 15-minute turnaround. 15-minute turnaround to clean, clean and restart the field. Now, this unit would not be suitable for bio separations because as Vish asked earlier, what's in the middle over here? Well, in the middle is air. So it's it's totally open to contamination. Okay, so if that's an issue in the unit that you're designing, um, then this wouldn't be a suitable uh, type of centrifuge. So this region over here is open to potential contamination when you're opening and closing the centrifuge. So there's there's a better alternative for bio separations. Um, a high L over D ratio actually it gives it some stability to the units. Uh, it's easier to, to control. And then here, I just put out of interest, uh, we can separate two liquids of different densities. So uh, say the milk and cream example, uh, your heavier fluid will flow to the wall and your lighter fluid will remain on top. And then you can use this ratio between the densities to find actually where that interface R2 is. You can theoretically calculate where that, uh, where that interface between the two fluids will form. Um, but that's, that's just more, more for interest than for us to, to go through the derivation. No, but it's, it's very easy to derive that equation. It's in gene complex if you are interested. Uh, and then here's just a, a slightly more realistic image. Uh, what we find with these tubular bowl centrifuges is that the precipitate layer will actually develop in a more diagonal form. Of <coughs> the liquid itself may even be, uh, have a slightly diagonal pattern to it. Uh, it's not quite as vertical as Okay, but, uh, what I do want to just end off the class here, we've got a few more minutes, is just to show you the disc bowl centrifuge. Now, uh, this one, I cannot possibly hope to explain this in words. So this, this phenomenal video uh, from this vendor that shows what it looks like and how it operates, and I'd rather show you that because it's going to be far more understandable. There's no words for tech voiceover.
it's all that dude, it's all, uh, there's no opening to the atmosphere over there, so that's a classic unit that's used in bio separation, so continuous spaces, and uh, useful cues and beverages. So tomorrow we'll design one of those for uh, removal of heat from here. And, uh,